Welcome to HD Nation, your guide to the best in HD content and the best in home theater gear, no matter what your budget is. I'm Patrick Norton. Hi, and I'm Robert Heron. It's kind of a bridge edition coming on. The yeah. Tech Feed channel has ended, but HD Nation is moving forward. Not entirely sure where it's going to go, but we got a lot of great stuff for you coming up in today's show. Interesting news, and we should point out Netflix is a sponsor of our show, Techzilla. Netflix.com slash Techzilla. If you haven't checked out Netflix, you should, because we all pay for it out of our own pockets and use it constantly. Netflix just announced this week the highest quality HD now available to all Netflix members. Basically, anybody can get access to their Super HD streams, at least within the continental United States, not just members with ISPs that adopted Netflix Open Connect, which essentially Netflix puts a server inside of your ISP, so basically to minimize uh, uh, peering charges against your ISP. Oh. So, a good idea. Yeah, in theory, you might get better video quality on some titles that are encoded in Super HD. It's essentially 1080p video with more bandwidth thrown at it, like 7 megabits per second for 2D video, as much as 12 megabits per second for 3D video. If you're wondering if your ISP is likely to deliver, you might check out the Netflix ISP Speed Index. This is the international one we're looking at right here. I'm going to go straight into the full, full, view full results for the U.S. And it's funny, so Google Fiber, average speed, uh, 3.58 megabits per second. Um, Comcast, it's funny, they, they're selling 2.0, but I routinely get like 5 megabits or higher. I want to say at least around 5 megabits. That sounds um, about right. Yeah, on for both of us probably, actually. Sustained download speeds, yeah. just not streaming, of course, but yeah. that, it goes probably two or three times that for me, yeah. which I, I do appreciate. Now, <laughs> along with the bandwidth, though, you're going to need the right hardware, and to get the Netflix in the new Super HD formats. You're going to be talking about using something like a PlayStation 3, a 1080p Roku box, third generation Apple TV, uh, actually the Nintendo Wii U, TiVo Premiere boxes, Windows 8 systems, and mm -hmm. televisions or set-top boxes with 1080p support, quote unquote. Yeah. There is no listing so far for the Xbox 360, uh, so far. They so. have added the Google Chromecast. I'm looking at the Netflix Super HD. Excellent. That's been updated in the Netflix Help Center right here. Um, you know, you can find Super HD titles by looking for the Super HD logo in the movie description page on compatible devices. Um, you know, it's interesting. Look, I've yet to find my Super HD title as far as I know. So, you know, keep an eye out for it. It's something to look for, but again, you need the bandwidth, check. You need the hardware. Actually, I have the hardware, check. Now I just need to find the titles. Um, I was finding the titles and mm -hmm. playing them, and it, I, I was having a difficult time figuring out if it was delivering. It was showing I was getting a full 1080p resolution, but was I getting the Super HD version or right. not? And I didn't see a, a distinct indicator for that performance. It said something like SP, and I wasn't sure I wasn't sure what that mm -hmm. meant, actually. So, yeah, that's one other thing. But I sense some network analysis in our future. <laughs> I, I want to know. I want to know if I was seeing it. And in digital image projection news, I, I'd sell someone's kid for this following projector. Stay out uh, of my house. Stay out of my house. Basically, digital projection just recently announced a brand new Titan 1080p LED 3D three chip DLP projector. Oh, let me get past the text. There's the pretty box. And if you scroll down that page, it actually shows the wonder machine right there. Talking, because it's LED lit, we're talking 60,000 plus wow. hour lamp life. And it's a three chip DLP system. This is an expensive box. Each chip would be dedicated to one of the primary colors, red, blue, or green. This results in a threefold improvement. You get higher bit depth, you get better color saturation, and more colors can be displayed. Uh, with uh, a DLP LED projector. Now, the single chip DLP LED projectors that we've looked at actually flash red, blue, and green sequentially, uh, one of the primary colors being projected at any given moment. You're not projecting all three simultaneously like you can do with a three chip projector. This is a $80,000 projector, so it's not gonna be for everyone, but it's entirely lustworthy as an Uber home theater projector, without a doubt, and probably one of the highest performing projectors currently available as far as picture contrast, color saturation, and other important aspects. We just want to make sure we're not just serving the low end, we're serving the high oh, end. No. And we actually, we, we have some, some context of digital projection, we've reviewed their products before. In the $5,000 range, gorgeous. Yeah. Projector oh. with inky blacks, I'm not going to sell one of my kids or my truck, but I'll save my <laughs> pennies. I'll sell a kid. Yeah, stay out of my I house. I got to see. The, I've seen the single chip LED projector from them in in action, and it it floored everyone in the room. Yeah. The three chip projector, because it also it has the three light paths simultaneously. It's delivering more light as well, so that'd be something really. Yeah, it's eighty grand though, so I'll leave it there. 
<laughs> that's a house. Wow. That is. That that's really, a really is. That's property. <laughs> hey, Snake Eyes 78 tweets at HD Nation at Patrick Norton at Robert Heron. Quote, wondering if you could recommend and review vinyl to MP3 converter turntable to buy. What? You don't want a stack <laughs> of turntables and on top of your Blu-ray player? Uh, actually, Patrick, you've touched vinyl LPs in this century. <laughs> <laughs> what do you recommend? I, every album I've ever owned, I somehow scratched and ruined. Uh, yeah. I need professional help. Yes. Well, for for you and I, professional help is 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 CDs and digital audio. <laughs> and I want to say first up, this isn't a segment for vinyl junkies looking for audiophile grade turntables. If you have a stack of 188 gram pressings along with vintage vinyl you've been collecting, I love you. My neighbor is one of y'all. I love listening. He's got vintage jazz albums that sound amazing. But I don't want emails telling me why Snake Eye 78 needs a $1,500 turntable with a $1,000 cartridge and pure power performance from an incredible $3,000 power massaging box. Just stop. What Snake Eye 78 probably needs is a USB turntable that will connect directly to his PC. Right now, probably the best ones coming out are from Audio Technica. This is their ATLP60 USB. It's a belt-driven turntable and a USB port. Really simple. Starts about $120. Newmark's TT-USB has a really good rep, too. That's selling at $100. Bucks. Just beware that these $100 USB turntables are not going to play 78s. Audio-Technica's ATLP120 will. They'll do 78s along with 33s and 45s, but you're going to spend about $245. Bucks. And by the way, for any of these turntables in the sort of $100, $200 range, I would think about replacing whatever cartridge comes with it with something nicer. I prefer Grado cartridges. I, I, judging by the gear I see in front of you, you didn't go <laughs> with the USB option, I take it. No. So a few years ago, when I found a, a bunch of Sky albums, uh, vinyl albums, they will never be released on CD. If they were released on CD, I would be buying the CDs. I looked at existing USB turntables, and they sucked. They really, 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 really sucked. The new ones, not so bad. The old ones, ugh. So I bought a regular turntable. It's like a, a Newmark DJ grade turntable, along with a phono amp and a nice Grado cartridge. Now, if your turntable doesn't have line level outputs or USB outputs, the audio that comes out of it is going to sound funny. You know, if you, if you take the jacks on the back of this and plug them into your audio card or your amplifier, your preamp, your, your, your analog to digital converter, um, it's going to sound wrong. That's because the audio on the album has RIA equalization. It basically makes the little tiny grooves on the record work better. The low frequencies are attenuated when they're laid down and the higher frequencies are amped. A proper phono preamp fixes this on playback and boost the signal going into your preamp. At least for all albums made after 1954-ish, pre-1954, almost every major record company had their own special flavor of equalization, and we're not going to get that deep into this now. That's so. fascinating. I had I did not know that. Well, basically, it, yeah, I'm, I, I'm, I'm not. <laughs> nope, I'll stop right there. <laughs> Y'all want to know, ask about it. Otherwise, I'm not geeking out on this because I, I can talk 20 Google minutes on later. this. Some audio software can correct this, but I prefer to use a, a, a standalone preamp. Um, I got mine from photopreamps.com, but you can get it from Amazon Audio Gear stores. Uh, I think mine was $30 when I bought it, and I want to say it's like 50 bucks now. But any of these amps, uh, preamps, will do a fine job. So you're then the depending on the, the digital audio converter in whatever PC you connect it to at yes. that point? Okay. Yeah, and, and they, I mean... Are they generally okay? They're generally fine. Okay. Uh, look, I mean, this is one of those things where s start simple, then get expensive. Yeah. You know what I mean? If you got some old albums, you're playing around with this, you got some albums that aren't available, start with the $100 USB turntable or think about going to one of the mail order services, then start spending money. Because this is one of those areas where, you know, first it's a $200 turntable and a $50 preamp, and then, you know, you use the sound card on your thing. Then you buy a, 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 an Asus Zonar sound card, that's like 200 bucks, and then you start upgrading everything, and then you own like $13,000 worth of audio gear. Baby steps. Baby steps. Start small. If it sounds good, you're done. Awesome. Retro Giant 5 emails. When you get some image retention on plasmas, do you guys recommend watching full screen content such as HBO, running the built-in screen wipe, or using something like the Disney Wow Pixel Flipper? Does one work better than the other? You would think the built-in screen wipe would be best since it's coming from the TV manufacturer itself. And as Retro Giant noted, most plasma TVs have a built-in screen wipe tool that can be used to clean up image retention. Uh, my plasma happens to bury this tool under the picture setup menu, and I can show that in the pictures here real quick. Just diving through, it was uh, pretty easy to get to, but screen burn-in protection. And it had a scrolling mode in addition to some other things as well. But the scrolling mode was key. It, it, it basically scrolls a high contrast black and white image across the screen until you tell it to stop. And there's a picture of 
the said high black and white. This was scrolling left to right, and you can tell it, it, it basically is a nice white grayscale gradient, essentially. It goes from peak white to black, and as it goes by, it will hopefully cycle the pixels enough to uh, help wipe out some image retention. Now, the playback of a single movie with video that completely fills the screen is usually enough to wipe out all traces of image retention. You don't have to buy a special program or even use the tool built into the TV. But doing this can sometimes take hours and hours to minimize the artifact. Now, there's also a sweet pixel flipper tool on the WOW disk that will evenly wear an entire plasma screen by flipping every pixel through every color. Now, personally, I would start by using the built-in screen wipe tool for an hour to see if that improves things. If and if that doesn't do it, let it run longer. And if also keep in mind that running a screen white tool or displaying something like the pixel flipper tool itself, that kind of displaying of a test pattern, it really ramps up how much voltage your TV is going to use and it will consume a lot more electricity. So that's just something to keep in mind. It will warm it up nicely, to say the least. So don't worry about image retention. I find that it, it is it's usually cleanable. You can usually get rid of it. Uh, I have seen cases, though, on LCD screens that were left static for way too long. That's far more difficult, I see, to, to, to massage out of the picture. You almost have to wear the rest of the screen a little more in order to get it to even out. So, And if you want to see the worst, well, I don't, it's probably not there anymore, but at the Wynn Hotel in Las Vegas, they had about 10,000 sharp pan, uh, LCD panels. They left them all with static imagery for about a year and every one of them had like a Kino screen on the bottom of them right. permanently burned in. And uh, they have since gone to a nice motion graphics screen on all of their displays I noticed in their, in their hotel and casino. So it can happen to anyone, folks. <laughs> so watch the Kino display at home if it's static. And yeah. I think that's it for this episode of HC Nation. If you want to find out what's going on with HC Nation, please check us out at revision3.com slash HC Nation. You can subscribe, you can watch. That's where we're going to be hanging out. Hey, and please email us your questions and suggestions anytime. And until then, thank you for watching.